You know what? I think it's time for us to stay angry about space. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Polymathy podcast. I am here with the angry astronaut, Jordan Wright. I'm so happy to have you here today. Uh, welcome, angry astronaut. Thanks very much. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about your channel. Everybody while watching should go and subscribe uh, to the angry astronaut YouTube channel. There's the link on the screen. Uh, or you could simply type the angry astronaut and find it easily. But something that I want to talk about with you, angry astronaut, immediately is something that really moved me, which was your interview with the late Dr. Gilbert Levin, who recently passed away, but whose work on the Viking uh, landers may actually have already discovered life on Mars. What do you think about that? Do you believe that life has already been discovered on Mars? Yes, I do. Um, you know, now, of course, you know, the, the common uh, place phrase that's always used uh, for extraordinary claims, you require extraordinary proof as the, you know, has the, uh, the bar for extraordinary proof actually been accomplished here. Um, I believe that it has. And I also believe that it's only going to be a matter of time before we're going to instead start asking why did we ever think this? Why did we think that life on another planet was an extraordinary claim? What made us so damn arrogant to think that, you know, we could be the only ones and that microbial life even wouldn't exist on a planet that is perfectly suited to support it? It's not perfectly suited to support us or most of the kinds of life forms that we are familiar with. But as far as microbial life is concerned, there are plenty of of kinds of microbes on our planet that could easily thrive on Mars. And I do indeed believe that that is what's been discovered. Yeah. And that is, uh, I was just thinking about the, the, the fact that we have actual meteorites that have landed on the earth from Mars. The famous Allen Hills one, uh, is, is just one among uh, many examples that have been positively identified as having come from Mars, which means that it is not unreasonable to assume that um, meteorites have landed on Mars from Earth, and that in fact there's a cross-pollination uh, of uh, material that's being transmitted between at least the inner planets. And yeah, these aren't very frequent, neither is lightning, but they, they, do, uh, they do occur, and over million-year, billion-year timescales, there uh, is a... Um, a possibility of at least a solar system panspermia, or at least a, I guess a solar system <laughs> spermia of a sort, is remains a possibility. And uh, well, wait a minute then. If um, Dr. Levin, his experiment, which uh, you know in detail better than I, I do, it was to detect life. So it had a component for detecting if there were organic uh, compounds. It had a way of detecting if you give you know nutrients that various kinds of uh, bacteria might might um, metabolize to detect an oxygen signal, if I'm not mistaken. And then there was also the other part of the test where they actually heated the sample. Could you uh, take us through that again? Yeah, first of all, to be clear, the experiment to find um, uh, organic molecules actually came up negative. And uh, the reason that it did, we know now, is because the equipment was not really designed to detect organic molecules, number one. And number two, it was not particularly sensitive. Since that time, the Curiosity rover has detected organic molecules on, on several occasions, and uh, so has Perseverance now at this point. So that that one missing piece of the experiment back in 1976 that would have um, conclusively proven the existence of life as far as NASA was concerned in 1976. Um, it might have been challenged since then, but that piece didn't actually exist. But the rest of it was incredibly compelling. Um, here's what was done. It's just an experiment that is used to detect the presence of bacteria in drinking water. So uh, Dr. Levin was going to introduce nutrients into the Martian regolith, which would then be consumed by the, any microorganisms 
and give off CO2 as a byproduct. The CO2 would be marked with radioactive isotopes, so it'd be easier to detect. And so you enter, and so as far as the nutrients they decided to use, um, Dr. Levin chose to use nutrients that are thought to have been very common during the primordial Earth many, many millions of years ago when microbial life first arose on this planet. So the samples were taken by both Viking 1 and Viking 2. The, uh, the nutrients were then introduced and lo and behold, you've got the CO2 byproduct. Now I wanna emphasize, no false positives have ever been created with this experiment hmm. in all the decades since 1976. So repeated experiments uh, on Earth? Correct. There have been many attempts made to try to create a false positive with this experiment on Earth, and none of them have ever been successful. Wow. So, but, you know, to add to that, though, of course, there are other steps to the experiment to prove that, you know, it wasn't something else causing it. So uh, a non-biological process. So the next step would be to take the regolith and then heat it to a temperature of about 150 degrees Celsius, which would be a enough to kill any uh, microorganisms that might be in the regolith. Then after you did that, um, kept it, you know, broiling for a day or so, and then introduced the, uh, the nutrients, there should be nothing consumed. It should have a zero result. That's exactly what happened. Right. Nothing happened after they did that exactly as anticipated. Then um, NASA wanted more information. They said heat it up a little bit to where it would kill a you know a percentage of the organisms, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. So they hit it with about 120 degrees Celsius. And uh, then they did it again. Lo and behold, 60% less than what happened previously. There have been so many efforts to try to make this happen with a non-organic process in the more than 40 years that have passed. And it's never happened. No, no one's been able to uh, duplicate it. But one other experiment was was taken. So there were some people who were theorizing, well, maybe the regolith getting bombarded by cosmic uh, rays and solar radiation, that sort of thing could create sort of a unique chemical environment that might somehow create this phenomenon. You know, some chemist put all together, you know, this possibility. So, you know, Dr. Levin said, okay, well, what I'm going to do then is move this rock that happens to be really close to Viking. I'll have the, the arm move the rock over and, and turn it over. And of course, this rock has been there for hundreds of millions of years. There's no process on Earth that, on, on Mars rather, that would have moved this rock <laughs> over all this time. There's obviously no flows of water, no really strong winds, anything like that. So they overturned the rock and dug up regolith that would have been shielded from cosmic rays for many millions of years and conducted the same experiment with the same result. The Amazing. evidence is overwhelming. And ever since then, ever since 1976, every discovery that we have made on Mars even it's even more strongly supports the existence of life. Um, unusual spikes of methane that only take place seasonally. Um, methane spikes can be explained with volcanism, but what volcanic process happens seasonally? Um, and also unusual spikes in oxygen which again, can't be described, can't be explained by much of anything, especially if it's seasonal other mm -hmm. than organic processes. The, the evidence is, is overwhelming in my opinion. Now, once again, does this qualify as extraordinary proof? It seems the scientific community doesn't believe that it does. And really until we take a scoop of regolith and say, hey, check it out, Here's here's the uh, here here's the molecules and here's the uh, here's the single celled organisms swimming around underneath our microscope. Yeah. No one's gonna no one's gonna admit that he discovered life. Well, it is somewhat baffling to me, and I worked a little bit on uh, on in that planetary sciences realm. And what really frustrated me was the time scales and the lack of data. You know, it's um, the things that planetary scientists. Uh, have been doing, for example, about a year or so ago, I had an interview here uh, with Dr. Alan Stern, who did the New Horizons mission. And the fact that I mean, he had to dedicate essentially his whole life, his whole like the main core of his his uh, career just new, to the New Horizons, had to wait for years for it to get to Pluto. And the, thank 
goodness, the whole thing worked and it created, it collected such great data. Um, but it, it's, uh, there's just so, you know, and we have all of this great data from New Horizons, but there's so much more to see at Pluto. And uh, when it comes to Mars, uh, I think still we have more than half of the missions that have been sent have failed, both Russian and uh, American. Uh, so it's not an easy planet to land on or to explore. And we just like, you know, we're seeing we have Mars Global Surveyor, we have these great images, but those are like decades old. And it's just so frustrating, especially when we keep sending landers and they don't have the same experiment. And that's what's really baffling to me, that we had to wait till Curiosity found, like you were just telling us, organic positively identified um, organic molecules on the surface of Mars, which means that the reason for dismissal that NASA gave of the biological experiment, which had a, a, uh, a verifiable positive for, for life, they dismissed because it didn't find organics. They've been found now. Why did Perseverance not go with it? Yeah. And to add to the frustration, Dr. Levin um, cooked up a uh, an, another version of the um, of the label release experiment, as it is called, um, to go on a, a future probe, a more advanced version of it. And uh, and NASA would never um, put it on anything. And then finally, he out of frustration, he went to the Russians in the 1990s who were sending their own lander to Mars. And initially, um, they got uh, they got a directive through the State Department uh, saying that you can't give this to the Russians, um, which, you know, for security reasons, which is absurd because the label release experiments, some of the most commonly used um, equipment that you can imagine, they use it to find bacteria in drinking water, for heaven's sake. It's not like there's mm -hmm. anything secret about it. It's very strange. And so um, Dr. Levin uh, snuck it onto the Russian lander anyway with their uh, with their assistance. So it was on there, and tragically, the Russian probe crashed. Um, and so we, you know, that uh, it it could have easily been announced in the 1990s. The Russians, I, the Russians definitely would have, you know, taken the opportunity to grab the spotlight if that had come up positive again. So and yeah. and announced that they had found life on Mars. So um, yeah. yeah, or the Chinese, because you were excusing for interrupting. But in your <laughs> interview with Dr. Levin, which was uh, over a year ago, um, the Chinese lander was on its uh, way or landing, and you were hoping that maybe they had a detector for it, and might have they might have claimed the first uh, positive evidence for life on, on Mars or something. But nothing. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard anything actually. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, he dropped off the radar for a while, and I thought he had dropped off the radar because he was in China. But unfortunately, the reason he had dropped off the radar is because he was in the hospital um, for a considerable period of time. Then he got out and he said, just give me a little time to, you know, to get a bit better and I'll be happy to give you another interview and all that. He was always really easy to interact with, a really easy guy to talk to. And mm -hmm. then he was gone. A couple of days after after we we talked, he was gone, um, and it was uh, just devastating. Um, and also, what was equally devastating is the fact that you know people talk about Dr. Levin like he's this, this outlier, this radical, this crazy guy who just you know started jumping to all these conclusions. His colleague, the co-director of this experiment, Dr. Patricia Strat, also claims exactly the same thing that he does. Um, and he gave me her contact information to, you know, to get an interview with her. And stupidly, I said, you know what, I'm, since I just did this interview with him, I'll give it a few months and then contact her and we can go from there. And she died. Oh, you know, my goodness. Idiot me, you know, thinking that I had time when we humans really don't have that much time on mm. this planet. I should have immediately jumped on that. And I will regret that for the rest of my life, that I didn't mm. immediately contact her because she had her own unique perspective on this. And it was just as supportive of the claim that Dr. Levin has made as well. Wow. That's that's a... Uh... That's really important for us to take to heart, I think, and anything uh, we might want to accomplish in life, whether uh, family or career related, not not to, not to wait, <laughs> you know, not uh, because uh, of that for that very reason. So um, that's a good cautionary tale. Well, when um, what, uh, oh, so uh, the uh, I wanted to get right into the. Uh, this this whole whole matter because of course everybody out there should go and see the and listen to these interviews that you have on your, your channel and other 
um, videos you've made about the topic. Uh, so now let me just uh, give a more general introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is the incredible angry as astronaut, uh, Jordan Wright, who has been doing some of, I think, the best space journalism that one can find. And the reason that I, I feel that way is because the angry astronaut uh, has been providing not just um, this, I think, fantastic uh, persona where you've taken your frustrations built up that a lot of us share over the years, the decades of seeing space programs, plural, flounder by being by lacking direction mostly usually not for lacking too much money though i mean i'm ha happy to fund them more if i had my way um but because they're you know it's, we're, you know it's these huge time gaps 10 years to get another lander on mars that kind of thing uh 15 years to get sls going or, or more five years over overdue so with if i if i understand that the reason that you are the angry astronaut is because you've channeled um the uh the, the this this frustration that we've all had into hey this is a problem but not only that you also have gone out of your way to do some of the best research i've seen to um and also make accessible these facts like the way that you're able to to just tell us all now in great and i think uh, very understandable detail how that experiment worked in viking um is uh is what i i think is such a, a value and why I, I recommend everybody out there to subscribe uh, to your channel. And if you, cause it's so, I've learned so much. Like I thought I was following this closely, but how much more closely you follow and have to. Uh, I just, um, I'm so happy to be uh, well-informed uh, about that. So yeah, how have, um, have you seen a positive impact? Obviously there, there's me, one audience member, but um, your audience, have they been able to get the same kind of thing that I've been getting out of it? Yeah, I'm, I, I guess that's a lot of the feedback I get. I mean, once again, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, is you know the fact that they they uh, they they like the the you know editorial nature of what I do. There are too many cheerleaders for the space program, and once again, I'm not coming here saying that I'm not an advocate for space. I'm a huge advocate for space, but instead of just cheerleading, we need to take a bit of a more critical look at how. We're um, we're supporting, you know, the exploration of the solar system, the the search for life on other planets. I don't talk about the search for life on other planets that often, um, but I do talk about it. But, you know, it's it's frustrating because, you know, NASA gets roughly twenty five billion dollars a year, which is a huge amount of money. But, you know, pathetic compared to the seven hundred to eight hundred billion dollars that the military gets, for example. Absolutely. I mean, it, it is a very, very um, meagerly funded program. And so as a result, that's one reason I get angry. It's not funded enough. But also, secondly, you know, it, there's so much waste, so much cronyism, uh, so much corruption involved in the uh, in the, the way contracts are doled out in the way that these companies companies do business. I mean, we've seen so much waste with the Artemis, for example. I mean, Artemis, I would say, is probably the worst example of corruption mm. and cronyism. Really? Uh, let's oh, yeah, let's definitely. hear it. I know you have hours of amazing uh, breakdowns of these, but uh, what really frustrates you about the Ar Artemis program? And what, wait, what is Artemis program? My, I know my audience uh, in general uh, is mostly familiar with languages and history and things like that. So what is Artemis? If you can believe it, people out there don't know. No, no, it's that's fine. There's plenty of people. Don't, certain most people here in the UK don't know a thing about what's going on. I understand. Um, and Artemis is our return to the moon. And, you know, it's although really that's another thing I get angry about is NASA doesn't really spell out what Artemis is exactly about. Um, I can tell you what my interpretation is. It's going back to the moon, this time to stay, to establish a permanent human presence on our natural satellite so that we can learn how to survive in interplanetary space before we make that big jump to make an interplanetary journey. Um, so that is, you know, the objective, but a lot of other things are discussed. For example, you know, what the most common thing is, we're going to put the first, um, woman of color, or, but the first woman rather and the first person of color on the moon. Well, I think that is an admirable goal, but when people are confronted with, you mean we're spending, you know, billions and billions of dollars just to put, you know, one woman and, and one person of color on the moon. That seems like a pretty, right. It's an, um, uh, it's an altitude yeah. limit. 
yeah, it seems yeah. to be kind of a, a pointless exercise. And that isn't the reason we're going back to the moon. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good, you know, side benefit. I mean, you know, obviously women and people of color were barred from this, you know, from exploring the moon because of blind prejudice back in the 60s and early 70s. And that's important to put all of that to a, to a stop, but that is not the main reason that we're going. So that's what Artemis is about. Um, in terms of why I'm angry about it, we are many, many billions of dollars horribly over budget on this project mm -hmm. and also years and years behind schedule. And in addition, we, according to, and once again, I'm not just making this up. This is according to NASA's own Office of Inspector General. They have said flat out, this project is unsustainable from a cost perspective, full stop. So the rocket we are currently using, SLS and Orion, we can't afford to launch that and keep this program going. It's well, let's too talk expensive. about su sustainable. I, like you said, it's to go to the moon and to stay, right? So sustainable for a decade, two decades. Like how far can we look into the future? I'm happy to look up to the 24th century, but uh, wh wh like, what does that mean sustainable? Unless we go there forever, this is a failure. Simple as that. We need to establish a presence on the moon and we never leave. That's what this should be all about. Now, mm. will that happen? I actually strongly doubt it. I think somebody is going to cancel this at some point, especially the way that it's laid out. Um, mm. It's not well planned to uh, create a permanent human presence on the moon or indeed even orbiting the moon. That's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the, the, the first step to this process is to have humans orbiting the moon on a uh, space station, kind of a mini ISS. Lofty. And that is yeah. the lunar gateway. Yeah. Um, at the I, very I least. where you landed on that in your, your opinion. Are you favor that or uh, would you favor, um, say, uh, a moon direct like Zubrin? I absolutely support Lunar Gateway. Uh, Zubrin is right about most things um, and even probably right about the fact that that's the most efficient way to go to the moon is moon direct. But in terms of actually sustaining our presence there full time, Lunar Gateway makes far more sense because Orbiting the moon requires less delta V and a lot less delta V. I'm sorry, that's a just an expression used by, by space nerds in terms of how much uh, velocity and fuel you require in order to get to a location and then to come back. So it requires a lot less fuel to go to a, a station orbiting the moon than it takes to land on the moon and then, and then take off. So if it's easier to get to the location, that means you can go there more frequently. You can bring more people there. It's easier to support those people once they're there. So you can maintain a constant ongoing presence on this space station, even if you don't have people on the surface of the moon full time. So if, you, if we can do that, if we can at least keep people on the Lunar Gateway full time, that means this project will never be canceled. Just like ISS, mm. who, what president is going to say, oh, you know what, that, that space station that we've got people on, that we've had people on for the last 10 years, you know, we don't need that. Let's get rid of that. No one's going to say that, you know, yeah. it, it, as long as it's as long as it's a viable um, program. And as long as we have people there full time, um, we will not abandon it. But, you know, we, the, the current plan does not really allow us to stay on the Lunar Gateway full time. So it's mm. it's flawed. Yeah, I can see that. Well, the it reminds me, too, of the fact that as much as we might like just to just, for example, Mars Direct or other things, just kind of like skip the politics like we were just saying, too, politics is an inevitable part of that. The same way that, no, oh, they're not going to kill the ISS or the Lunar Gateway once it's in operation and once there are people there. Uh, because it, it's just as a PR thing and as a for political reasons isn't, um, isn't great. So it's interesting. That's a way to maybe temper our frustration with certain things, even the ISS or the space shuttle, which um, uh, I... I, I was for a long time just wished, OK, done space shuttle. Let's go constellation program. That's how how long, long I've been following all this. Yeah, so, me too. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. So, the, well, what else is when you're talking about either uh, 
corruption or maybe not um, a corruption in the sense of uh, malignant or no, malignant or uh, people doing things with malice as far as the Artemis program. But what about just uh, mismanagement of things? I'm thinking about the launch tower, about the different providers of the hardware. And the uh, worst Artemis. example is ML1. Um, the the launch tower um, and and that is really what caused the scrubs all of the hydrogen leaks everything that we heard about that's that where the hydrogen the was leaking from from ML one I didn't know that uh, almost almost entirely yeah wow. um, it, it really only there was only one minor problem with the rocket and that was apparently a fault with one of the engines and that was just a faulty sensor there wasn't really a problem with the rocket so wow. at the ground systems ML one is a cobbled together piece of garbage and <laughs> Again, this is not me making this up. This is the NASA OIG and what they say about it. Um, Do NASA call it garbage? Yeah, they, well, uh, it, not <laughs> not in so many ahead. words. No. Yeah, why is it? Yeah. yeah, why is it this cobbled together piece of garbage? There are three different contractors involved in the construction of this. This launch tower wasn't even designed for a rocket as big as SLS. Not even close. It's for Ares One, this, right? Yeah, correct. The Ares yeah. program, which that that thing was less than half the size of SLS. So, you know, first of all, it wasn't even designed for it. So you had the original contractor who built the launch tower for Ares. Then after that, you had another contractor. And the idea was, oh, let's just convert it. We'll save a lot of money doing it that way. The next contractor, you know, worked on that and was found to be so ineffective and so flat out inept that they were fired, although they got a nice little bonus before they got fired. Um, and then they brought in a third contractor and that contractor also did an atrocious job. And uh, there were important steps that were skipped, um, important parts, you know, in terms of ensuring the reliability. Yeah, there's the Aries right there. As you yeah, can see, which never very, very our, uh, different uh, than never. SLS, very different. Yeah, it's it's this tiny little. It's like a solid rocket booster with uh, with payload, essentially, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, I mean, really outdated, even from what we're using today. I mean, the, people are still talking about actually developing that. I can't imagine why, but anyway. Um, so yeah, I, the thing of it is, you had three different contractors, none of whom actually really communicated effectively with one another um to get this thing operational and it it went many many hundreds of millions of dollars over budget um and how it much? took many uh, pardon how, how much over budget <laughs> about 600 million dollars over budget yeah Man. and this is only one little part of the program keep in mind I mean, the whole thing has cost like $25 billion, which is <laughs> more than double what it was estimated to cost, the whole SLS program. I mean, it's billions and billions over, over budget. And, uh, it's, and again, many, many years behind schedule. It was supposed to fly in 2017. Um, and, you know, obviously it just flew. So yeah, it's it's been a a program really just laden down with you know ineptitude, complexity, and contractors not doing their job properly, and yeah, it's it's just been a nightmare. Um, not every part of it has been a nightmare. I think Orion um, has performed very well. I think that it would have Orion would have been ready probably by 2017 if SLS had. Um, Orion actually flew for the first time in 2014. Now, of course, this wasn't um, this wasn't you know a fully fledged, fully developed Orion yet. It didn't have a life support system on it yet or anything like that. But they did fly it into orbit, tested it, and it splashed down in the Pacific, no problems. Um, it did very well. It flew on a Delta Delta IV Heavy, actually. Um, so mm. you know this thing went to orbit eight years ago. Orion did. I remember that. It was crazy. Yeah. I was like, well, it's only a couple years away, and then. 2017 and came and went. Is this yeah. uh, a real photograph? I haven't been looking at them. Yes, uh, it is. Yes, it's a real is. photograph from Artemis One's uh, Orion spacecraft, which is the 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 primary spacecraft, shall we say, after all the boosters are all dropped off. Which um, is it currently orbiting the moon, or is it on its way back? Yes, it's it's still currently under the influence of. Uh, of the moon's gravity, although it's beginning its uh, its its process of heading back towards Earth, it's on a trajectory that's going to take it back towards Earth. It'll still take a couple of burns during uh, during its journey to fully break away from the moon's influence and uh, and splash down. 
Mm. Okay. And uh, what's the uh, splashdown date? Uh, seven days from seven days and some odd hours. Seven days. All right. Cool. Sorry if I'm. Uh, don't know if my screen is freezing on on the public side, but hopefully it's okay uh, out there. Good. Yeah. Well, that that is at least uh, good news that the central program. So, is now all that said, is it time to cancel Artemis and just have uh, SpaceX take us to the moon for and make that the whole Artemis program instead? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We have no idea. I mean, I have a lot of confidence that SpaceX is going to be able to make Starship work, but we really haven't the slightest idea if that rocket is going to is going to function as promised or not. I mean, a 33 engine super rocket with twice the thrust of SLS, that thing is a monster. And I'm going to be watching it take off, by the way, at only five and a half kilometers distance from Rocket Ranch. Uh, I, wow. it, I'm as I'm as excited as I am terrified. Um, that is a I mean, that that thing is is just uh, one of the most intimidating things I can imagine. But so, yeah, I mean, you know, we have yet, you know, mankind has never been able to successfully launch a rocket that has a propulsion system that is that complicated and has that many engines. The Soviets attempted it, 37 engines actually on N1, and they tried four times and it blew up four times. So, you know, but, you know, is SpaceX better than the Soviets were in the early 70s? Yes, I think they are. Um, and I think they'll be able to do this. But, you know, are they going to do it successfully the, the first time around? I'd say there's a really good chance they're going to blow that thing up on the pad. And if they do, it's going to be a conflagration that's going to just annihilate that whole area, the tank farm, the launch pads, everything. And mm -hmm. then it's going to take them many months uh to 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 try again if it blows up on the pad hopefully it doesn't but i think there's a decent chance that it will it would, it would explain um, so, why it's taken so long i actually thought it would be fourth of july this year and then now it's december so uh yeah. when when do you think uh it's gonna go up uh earliest first quarter next year okay. earliest um yeah december that's way too i mean we've been hearing this i mean elon was saying we were going to go in the summer of 2021 that starship would be ready for that you know I mean, I we got to stop paying attention to elon's tweets um <laughs> yeah i believe i like the guy I, I mean i like his vision anyway there are things about him that i definitely don't like but <clears throat> in general i love his vision i love i think he's kind of the modern day howard hughes um, and I think he's going to, you know, he's obviously already accomplished. That's great dubious things. praise for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think he's, I think he's, yeah, I really like the guy, but at the same time, it is pointless to pay attention to anything he says on Twitter when it comes to launch date estimates and stuff. He's just saying whatever pops into his mind at that particular moment. Um, I'm sure with the facts he has at the time, he probably thinks it's true. Hence mm -hmm. Elon time. Yep. Uh, and yeah. that's why we have the expression Elon time. So, exactly. yeah, I'd, I'd say first quarter next year at the earliest. And I mean, they just took Booster 7 off the pad um, after their most recent static fire. So, you know, they still need to do a wet dress rehearsal with that thing. They still need to um, do an actual real static fire when the whole thing is stacked. They haven't done that yet, um, so mm. they need to do that. And honestly, I think they're still a little afraid to do that. I think they... They still want to gradually ramp up to this. If, like I say, if they blow that thing up, it is going to be very bad for the whole program. So they got to be cautious. Now, I remember following uh, with uh, great detail. The last couple of months, I haven't been following nearly as much. Something somewhat of fatigue. I want to talk to you, too, about that being a YouTuber, a, a space exploration a YouTuber, about how that works with the algorithm and and uh, what's going on in the real world and how it affects uh, views and, and subscribers and things like that. But they have a sound suppression system that's integrated into the launch mount, right? They just haven't tested it yet or have they? No, they they have tested it. They've been testing it during okay. these uh, during these static fires. In my opinion, it's not robust enough. Um, it doesn't, if you can, I mean, it's more yeah. powerful than the space shuttles and there's, there's no trench, there's, there's nothing. It's just some concrete that gets blown yeah. into smithereens, right? I don't get it. Now, once again, I'm not the expert, but spoken to a whole lot of experts about this now. 
And this just doesn't seem to be the right way to proceed. I mean, I think they need a flame trench and I think they need a more robust sound suppression system. I'm not really sure what they're playing at here. Um, And we continue to see very clear, tangible evidence that trying to launch this thing on a concrete pad is not a good idea, that it's going to it's going to generate a a maelstrom of concrete fragments. um, And that's not just going to go away from the ship. It's also going to, you know, Air up those the, nice the engines. engines. Yeah, yeah. We just, it just, it seems to be a needless and unwarranted gamble to to try to launch under those circumstances. I mean, what's it going to take to to build a flame trench and and get a you know proper noise suppression system out there? I just, I don't understand why they haven't been more am, ambitious with that. I don't know. I would would it cut into the water table? But it does out at Canaveral too. If they have yeah. to go. I guess I have to build a ramp and all that. I don't know. Uh, I haven't really thought through. By the way, all of you out there, if you have questions for the angry astronaut, he is incredibly knowledgeable, uh, despite his his, uh, humility uh, from a moment ago, about uh, these topics and certainly has done uh, the research to to answer your questions about uh, space programs and space exploration. So if you have any, uh, just uh, make sure there's a question mark at the end of your your comment, and uh, we'll see if we can get it in. I have questions, too. Uh, about these uh, things. So is the uh, the only spaceport of value in Cape Canaveral or in Boca Chica or in uh, Vandenberg? No, no. I mean, that very soon, in my opinion, and very soon, the second busiest spaceport in the world is going to be here in Britain, where I am right now. Yeah, in Cornwall. Um, the Cornwall spaceport, right? Actually, not Cornwall. Cornwall will will have some activity, but there's another one that they are very close to completing um, in Shetland right. uh, on the other side of, of Britain and uh, the north side, that is. And you've got uh, they have three launch pads there completed, two more under construction. Um, and their current approved launch cadence from the government is 30 rockets per year. So every 10 days launching wow. a rocket. Um, and they have the customers. There are seven different launch providers who have already signed up to launch from there, two from Germany, um, two from the United States, a couple from Britain. And, and they're what signing kind of boosters, though? What, I'm sorry? What, uh, what boosters and uh, what uh, launch providers? Um, it's uh, there's RFA, which is uh, Rocket Factory Augsburg out of Germany. Um, they once again, none of these are particularly huge rockets. We're talking launching anywhere from a couple hundred kilograms to maybe one and a half metric tons out into space. So we're talking rocket lab type of uh, launch providers here. But um, you've got RFA. You've also got High Impulse, also out of Germany. You have a uh, UK launch provider called Skyrora. Um, they're going to be launching out of there as well. Uh, You've also got um, Astra out of the United States. Um, They've been struggling to try to, I mean, they've gotten at least one launch into orbit, as I recall, but they've had many failures too. So they're they're kind of still struggling at the moment. You also have another one called ABL um, Mm -hmm. and they are uh, getting ready to, to do their maiden launch from Kodiak Island in Alaska, their second launch will be from Saxivore. We're, we're looking at them launching first quarter next year. That's tremendous. Well, uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to cover as much of that as possible for us. And uh, that's why you should all, if you're just joining us, subscribe to The Angry Astronaut, whose YouTube channel is incredibly informative on everything that's going on in space exploration uh, and in uh, the various space programs uh, around uh, the world. And so we've uh, already talked today about uh, the search for life on Mars. We might have actually found it, so you have to go back and see that part. At the beginning, we talked about the Artemis program, which will take people, uh, take human beings to the moon again, which is is great. And let me ask another uh, one of those, those fun little questions. Um, moon or Mars? Oh. oh, we definitely need to go to the moon first. Um, I, there are many people, indeed, very, very smart people who are way smarter than me, who say that Mars Direct is the way to go. Um, but I'll tell you, um, there's one fellow who works at a place called Space Guard here in the UK. They are actually the only uh, real uh, proper institution anyway that studies near Earth objects, in other words, asteroids that could hit our planet. And uh, he made a really good point. Unless you actually experiment with it, 
it doesn't exist. So in other words, when we're talking about interplanetary travel, taking humans outside of the cocoon of our magnetic field and putting them on a ship and sending them out into the damn void, you know, to, uh, to and see what happens to them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, until we actually do that. And for longer than the few days that we did it back in the Apollo program, they have to mm -hmm. do it for a long period of time until we do that. It does not exist. And it is a lot easier and a lot safer to attempt interplanetary travel from here to the moon rather than trying an interplanetary travel for the first time from here to Mars. Thank you for calling um, the moon a planet. I agree. <laughs> yeah. We, well, it's, in it's planetary sciences, world. the moon is, is, has a planetary surface. And so, so yeah, that's uh, one of those old... Uh, those uh, the astronomers who got uh, I, this is again my my uh, opinion about these things that the astronomers got a little bit too astrologically influenced with their categorizations and the IAU de uh, deplanetize things for which makes I don't know we all, we have videos about that anyway. Yeah, Pluto was the most I agree with the Pluto was the, was the most ridiculous decisions I can imagine. I mean, and honestly, I think that if they had made that decision after New Horizons sent back its photos and its analysis, I don't think they would have done it. No. Such an incredibly vibrant um, and geological process is going on on that planet uh, that we, I will definitely say planet all, all day long with Pluto um, yeah. that we did not think were even possible. I mean, we, the, the, the overwhelming consensus before new horizons arrived at Pluto was that tiny little worlds like that die. Their, their cores go inactive and you, you're not going to have active geological processes with those kinds of worlds after that. The only places where you do have active processes is what, what was thought are places like, you know, Io and, and Europa. In other words, they have to be very close to a gas giant where there'll be huge gravitational forces influencing their planetary cores. And so therefore that's why you get all that geological activity. But with Pluto, way the hell out in the middle and nowhere and and no gravity and then it should be dead and guess what it isn't not even close to dead it's far more active than mars is far more active yeah and that's mind-blowing it really is and that's why the uh i think that's something that bothers me too about the uh having not sent another experiment even the duplication of um dr levin's experiment on some other spacecraft i know there's limited space and like oh well there's no organics obviously you know now we've I, I i don't see why there isn't just this tremendous well maybe there really is come on and, and seeing more scientists go ahead and and try to push for hey let's just let's be sure let's repeat the experiment let's do it better two more times like viking one and two and see what happens because it if it then we have a true negative that's important to know uh, Dr. Levin, I remember talking about uh, his concern about the possibility of uh, microbes. If we don't have them fully studied, they might infect part of the uh, Earth biosphere if there's actual human astronauts that are going there and coming back. I, I feel some degree of skepticism towards that. And I'm informed by what I read in Dr. Uh, Robert Zubrin, where he talked about the fact that I believe you even mentioned this, I, I think, at one point that um, microbes that are pathogens that infect a host have to have evolved with it in order to infect it. Um, I'm not, I have no interest in contradicting the late uh, Dr. Uh, Gilbert Levin, but um, that's how I feel. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think that it is very, very likely that is what the situation is. However, we also have to keep in mind that, first of all, we don't know how much transpermeation there may have been between our planet and Mars over all of these many millions of years. It could have been that the evolution of those microbes has existed side by side with the biology on our own planet, and we've had a shared ecosystem between our two planets over all that time. Um, you know, with with uh, with molecule or rather with uh, single celled organisms having been transferred to uh, Mars and back again, um, you know, over all that time. And so there has been contact to some degree. And of course, there's another thing to consider as well. Once again, is this likely? No, I don't think it is. But 
you know, what if, you know, a, an organism that has survived under these really difficult circumstances, what if it's evolved to be able to latch on to just about any kind of organic life it comes across? Because that is a survival mechanism for something that has to evolve under those very difficult circumstances. Hmm. You know, what if it's way more adaptable than anything here on Earth? Um, because of its of its need to survive. If that is indeed the case, then we could run into a disease that can adapt way faster than COVID could, for example. Mm. Um, I think that it's worth it to at least consider the possibility and the, the best way to avoid any problems would be to have um, the sample return mission from Mars deliver the, uh, deliver the samples to the Lunar Gateway and have them studied there first. I remember uh, where I was uh, once working, a, a professor who actually got to work on, on perseverance and uh, explaining and talking about how the uh, perseverance is going to collect the, the, the things to be, you know, geocached for the sample return mission. I'm like, when is that? Oh, there's no, there's nothing planned. There's no. no hardware or anything. Oh, I think I'm trying to remember now, maybe a European uh, lander would get it and send it back. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, I think they have they have their plan. They just came out with it recently. I, honestly, but, but perseverance I is barred from going places where there might actually be like liquid water on the surface anyway, because of planetary protection, thus yeah. defeating <laughs> the purpose of trying to do this. Humans are yeah. going to Mars, as as you are. I'm convinced is going to happen in a mm -hmm. decade. Uh, I think a decade. Let's just say a decade. And when that happens, I think we should know what we're getting into i don't it would be um it'd be impressive well I, we have a, a question uh will the skylon space plane ever fly i want to talk about space plane to start with skylon i honestly i don't know they i mean uh, you know they they certainly uh they they have a new um version of skylon um it, it, you know little models that that uh, reaction engines is is showing to people right now but for everybody else's benefit that's a uh, an organization here in the united kingdom um that has been working on what's called an ssto single stage to take off um solution to get uh, orbit instead grid. of the rockets we use now so um yeah we made yeah, there we go that's that's skylon um and so yeah it's uh it's it's you know they they certainly are are working on it there have been so many but there has to be a lot of investment obviously and isa initially invested money in it you know well over a decade ago and then they stopped it's it's just another one of those programs that has never really gotten going but now that the european space agency at least claims to be serious about human space flight they want to do their own human space flight this would be a perfect way to do it this would be a great way to put humans in orbit without having to you know develop a lot of stuff from scratch because a mm. lot of the design work's already been done yeah. Have the engine's been fully designed? The, 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 there's an engine test bed. Actually, it's in Colorado, my home state. Huh. Um, and uh, no, they, they don't have fully developed engines, but That's they the will. Part I understand about rocketry and getting the yeah, engine. They'll be putting them through their paces next year, actually. They're very close. And of course, once you have the engines, you, you're more than halfway there. Mm, absolutely. Well, let's talk about another space plane I think you like. Uh, what can you tell us about Dream Chaser? Oh, man. Um, my favorite spacecraft, period, um, right now, yeah. anyway. It's, it is incredibly neat. Um, I've seen it on the factory floor. I've seen it being put through stress tests and things like that. It is a mini space shuttle that will be mounted on top of a Vulcan Centaur rocket once those actually fly. Um, hopefully in February is when the first Vulcan Centaur goes. But um, as you can see, it looks like a space shuttle. Um, this is an earlier version of uh, Dream Chaser. This is the one that was supposed to be human rated before NASA stupidly decided that they didn't want to go with it um, and instead decided to get Boeing to build another space capsule, which still doesn't work, by the way. Um, so so yeah. in any event, uh, but uh, it, you, you launch it up on top of a rocket, it, it delivers payload to the ISS and then glides back down. And the reason it has advantages is uh, the biggest advantage that it has is it doesn't require huge amounts of infrastructure to retrieve it. Ocean recoveries are tough. Ocean recoveries require a lot of vehicles, ships, helicopters, etc. You don't yeah, need maybe. any of that. 
all you need is an airfield that can handle a 747 landing. It can land, as a matter of fact, Spaceport Cornwall has now been licensed um, to uh, to uh, provide a landing strip for um, for a Dream Chaser. Um, another advantage that it has is it's a very low um, gravity G-force trajectory that it takes when it re-enters the atmosphere, only one and a half G. So that means if it has very sensitive experiments on board, that sort of thing, this is the only way to get those things back to Earth without running into problems. Um, you know, when Crew Dragon re-enters the atmosphere, that's you know six, seven, eight G's worth of force at least on the on the spacecraft and on the passengers on board. So mm-hmm. it's a lot more flexible. Um, also, it has uh, payload superiority as well. It has a, uh, a pod attached to the back of it called the uh, shooting star. And between those two, it can carry more payload than Cargo Dragon can from SpaceX and, and some other solutions. Um, and, uh, and also the shooting star can serve secondary missions once it drops off its payload. The U.S. military has already contracted Sierra Space to use um, the uh, shooting star as a military satellite. Um, and it, by the way, it's not it's not as much a cargo pod as it is an independent spaceship. Um, I don't know if you can pull up shooting star and kind of show how that works. Let's look at shooting um, star. shooting star Sierra Space, but. Uh, it's, it has its own engines. It has its own solar panels. It's a fully self-contained spacecraft unto itself, which means it can carry out all kinds of additional missions once the primary mission is completed. Um, so it's it's just a really cool spaceship. Um, and it flies for the first time in the first quarter of 2023. We are months away. As you can see on the back there, first, there's the... First quarter of next year? Yeah. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, we are just a few months away. Of course, that is largely dependent on Vulcan Centaur, on ULA and their ability to get Vulcan Centaur uh, into orbit. Are they being uh, held up by um, the uh, the B4? Yes, Blue Origin has, has created lots of problems for them. Um, but the BE, both BE4s are now tested, flight certified, and delivered, and now um, on the the uh, the Vulcan booster. So mm-hmm. it's it's ready. the The only thing holding it up now is it has to carry out a more complicated mission than was originally planned. Originally, it was just supposed to send the Peregrine lander to the moon. Um, and mm-hmm. now it has to uh, it has to not only do that, it's also going to be deploying the first um, Kuiper satellites and pilot satellites for the Amazon Kuiper satellite constellation. It's going to drop those off. That's really going to test the capabilities, by the way, of what's called the Centaur 5 upper stage, the second stage of this spacecraft. Centaur 5 will have to fly into low Earth orbit drop off the Kuipers, and then push um, the Peregrine lander the rest of the way to the moon. So it's added complexity to the mission. Hmm, I see. Well, that, I guess we'll hope for the best. I, I really hope to see. Um, I really feel like we're on on the verge of, uh, of something that I was denied to us when we were young, uh, when, you know, expecting the shuttle to have been a temporary thing. Um, I remember I had a uh, my physics professor in, as an undergrad, Doctor DeLeo. I remember his name. Uh, so he was uh, what's a wonderful fellow and the happiest, most positive. So uh, excited to teach physics concepts to, to uh, undergrads and all all levels, uh, either people who had knew nothing about physics to those who knew a lot about it. And I asked him this kind of thing, and it was the only time he really had this. From the smiley guy to just this this sadness and saying how how his generation of scientists uh, were their hearts were broken by the um, discontinuation uh, of Apollo and that it wasn't succeeded by uh, similarly ambitious programs. Certainly, we've learned a lot about uh, science through um, the space shuttle program ISS, but I just think if we had something kind of like in the For All Mankind uh, TV show. Uh, not that I necessarily want that timeline. It has some dark aspects to it. Yeah. But um, how much farther we, we could be. And um, it feels like we're finally, as a, as a species, doing what Carl Sagan exhorted us to do all those, those decades ago. Yeah, 
Um, my uncle was career NASA is one of the biggest inspirations, uh, from, for me doing what I do. Uh, he worked at, at the Cape all the way from the beginning of the Apollo program, almost to the retirement of the shuttle program. Um, and he and I used to talk a lot in the 1990s about how we could get back to the moon. Um, at the time, of course, we didn't have Saturn V rockets anymore, but what we did have was the um, was some very powerful rockets from the Soviet side of things or the Russian side of things it was right after the collapse of the, uh, the Soviet Union. They had rockets that were uh, the Energia rockets, as they, they were called, that were capable of tossing 20 metric tons to the moon, which mm -hmm. is what SLS can do. Um, yeah. So, I mean, then they had that way back then. So if we had really wanted to, and if we had really want to collaborate with the Russians, we could have been sending people back to the moon in the 1990s. Oh, and we, we could technically didn't. do it uh, in, with um, the Falcon Heavy, not just not to maybe launch people. You can launch people on something else, the Falcon 9, which is human rated, but the Falcon Heavy could do the rest. It's, I think, interesting that, you know, the, 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 the inertia of everything, you know, some, a boulder was rolled and began to roll in constellation and in the uh, 2000 the first decade of, uh, of this century and then it's broken apart into things and now it's sls and it's still rolling meanwhile you got spacex going in fact one of those things too uh asked here is uh, will point to point commercial starship flights end up landing and taking off from from land adding an hour to on a boat each and really limits the flights which will be competitive with airliners. So this is talking about uh, a wonderful imagination that may come to fruition, possibly that uh, SpaceX wants to do where the Starship itself will be able to bring people point to point on Earth. What do you what do you think about that? I, they'll have to prove it to me. <laughs> I really, really, I mean, we're talking, we're talking the biggest rocket by far that's ever been built by the human species. Um, you know, launching a super rocket is never going to be something as casual. I mean, we see that right here. If that were indeed to take place right from, you know, let's say that that's Manhattan in the background, the sheer noise of launching that close would shatter all the windows in those skyscrapers. Um, so it's just, you know, there are so many really big issues with trying to do that to say nothing of the fact that, I mean, the whole, the, the whole aspect of trying to put a lot of people on a super rocket, having it, you know, fly essentially suborbital, then going back down and then trying to land that thing perfectly without any failures time. And again, um, you know, just as reliably and just as safe as a commercial airliner, I think we're many years away from that. Um, it's it's a great dream, um, and and if hell if they do it, and I'd love them to prove me wrong. Believe me, I would love them to prove me wrong, and I'd love to fly on something like that without an abort system. Um, you know, I I think that something like that would be kind of a disaster waiting to happen. And that's another very good point. You know, in order to safely launch it and not to create a whole lot of problem for people on the ground, you have to launch that from the ocean many miles out to sea, which really reduces its its competitive abilities. Mm, yeah, that's uh well, I'm optimistic. Actually, I think that I like uh, that quite a bit about uh, your brands, uh, should I say that you are because it's not uh, like an excessive anger as the uh, angry national at all. It's uh, a very rational frus uh, frustration. And uh, the, the fact that you bring this realistic, but also optimistic tone is why uh, I've been so happy to have uh, turned on a little bell icon and getting every, <laughs> every one of your, your videos whenever they come out. So I encourage all of you out there to do the same. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about how, um, how has the irregular cadence of launches of big things like SpaceX, the fact that Falcon 9, I used to watch every single one, every single landing, even after the fact, even as early as maybe earlier this year, I would still, because I, you know, I get the SpaceX updates of their live streams, and then I would want to go see the landing. And then at some point, I 
it just got so routine. I didn't care as much anymore. And that inevitably happens with all these things. And how many times can pe people be excited for, ah, oh, the, the, uh, the uh, super heavy boosters back on, on the pad, you know, like how many, uh, how does that affect um, the, uh, the space YouTuber, that irregularity? Oh, in a big way. I mean, once it once, you know, launching Falcon nines and landing Falcon nine boosters becomes a casual and routine thing, then, yeah, um, you you uh, lose attention. It, you lose um, you lose popularity. You lose views. It's kind of how it works. Um, it's why I try to put out as, as big of a variety of stuff as as I can. Um but yeah, and but you know, I think it's important that we always keep in mind that this is still rocket science. This is still amazing stuff that's going on right now because the shuttle got to be routine for us too back in the day. Um, you, you may not be quite old enough to remember these things, but in from from the years between 1981 and 1986 shuttle launches became something that nobody even bothered to tune into. As a matter of fact, um, news agencies generally wouldn't even carry the launch. Um, they wouldn't in interrupt the Richard Simmons show back, back way back when uh, the, Richard Simmons was an incredibly annoying guy who did um, workout videos for, you know, for stay at home moms and stuff. And they would get all bent out of shape and up in arms mm -hmm. every time NASA would preempt the Richard Simmons show for God's sake. Um, so they would stop doing it. I mean, there were only a few networks back in those days. And so, you know, they, they, they wouldn't even get broadcast live. And so, you know, and then Columbia happened, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, seven astronauts die in front of millions of school kids across the country. You know, millions of school kids get traumatized. I mean, my brother, uh, you know, his teacher was calling me frantically, um, you know, right after that it blew up because uh, there's still the fog of war at the time. He was afraid my uncle might have gotten hurt that it blew up on the pad, that sort of thing, because my uncle would always be really close to the launch pad wow. when those things would go. And, you know, as I'd say, no, nah, it blew up way up, way in the atmosphere and all that. But yeah, and of course, that, that sadly is what got everybody's attention is when, when the thing blew up. Um, it's, it's like awful. Apollo 13 and the if anyone's seen the movie Apollo 13 you should by the way uh, as is depicted there the uh, most of the television networks in 1970 uh, didn't cover the uh, the launch of Apollo the uh, all the um, now they covered the launch but not the um, televised program on the way to the moon they all the networks stumped them if I remember and yeah. and no one paid attention and then then there was the great disaster and then you know if I why people want want if he suddenly interested when he's not going to the moon? Well, it's a big national disaster, and his and Mrs. Yeah. Lovell retorted in her, um, you know, with her justifiable frustration and anger as well. There's an angry astronaut, Mrs. Lovell. Yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's 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 good to see those sorts of things, um, and yeah. It's it, it, it's it's another thing to get frustrated about. I mean, just people don't care about space flight, and especially what, what, now. What, what the wow. heck's going? Wait a minute. We have not, not not just you, but other YouTubers out there and many other people who have made a career out of just talking about this stuff, of being science communicators in uh, the legacy, I'd like to think, of uh, of Carl Sagan. But here's something that surprised me. I uh, recently rewatched the first, well, actually the second season of Cosmos, the one with uh, the first one with Neil deGrasse Tyson from 2014. Um, and because uh, I wanted to, to show it to my girlfriend and uh, it was so great to watch again, so rich and um, so moving and inspiring. And I found out there was another one that he did two years ago in 2020. Now, I'm not the biggest Spades nerd ever, but how did I not even hear about it? Yeah. They didn't advertise it, I guess, or as much or I wasn't paying attention. But how something like that could slip me by. Either there's something wrong with my ability to go out there and find really important space documentaries that I know I would love, or and maybe I I also suspect that there just wasn't a lot of buzz about it. Like people were talking about the, that first Cosmos, but not the with Neil deGrasse Tyson, not the second one. Is so what's wrong with us? How can we see the most incredible things ever wrought by human hands, and then not pay attention anymore, and then become upset that uh, 
uh, Richard Simmons is being interrupted. Yeah. What's what, what's up? What do you I, think? I don't know. I, I and and we are really seeing a lot of evidence of of what goes on in the world and what people really want to tune into right now. I mean, I think that's become painfully obvious to us. Uh, you know, in recent years, there's a YouTuber I love to watch. His name's Cody Co. Um, he's he's got you know millions of subscribers or whatever. He's just he's a comedian, right? But he does a lot of reaction videos on things that are popular on YouTube. And he did one on Facebook. And there's, I mean, he did one guy was like, is, is like somebody had a, a video camera, some sort of security camera and, you know, people asleep in their beds. And, and in the next bed, there's, you know, something moving underneath the, the blankets and stuff. And, you know, this guy's freaking out for a moment and thinks something's going on in the bed, you know, and that kind of thing. And you spend minute after minute watching before it suddenly shows that it's, this woman giving CPR to this guy, supposedly it was all fake. And it's the stupidest thing you could ever imagine. You know, why would somebody spend all of these minutes to get that lame payout at the end of it, this dramatic music playing in the background, et cetera. Those clips get over a hundred million views one after another. And it's some of the most brain dead content you can imagine yeah. over a hundred million people watching and many, many millions of likes too. <laughs> It's like, yeah. how can, <laughs> so I just, I don't know. I just, I, it, it kind of makes me bummed for the, for the, for the future of our species yeah. to, to see just how popular this stuff is. I grew up <laughs> in the nineties watching the discovery channel among, you know, the learning channel and the history channel. But uh, right as I was kind of leaving that kind that, that phase of, being being a kid and being inspired by those shows is when the channels themselves changed to be talking about more about ancient alien nonsense and uh about uh you know the monster trucks and 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 uh, whatever else they, they ended up becoming like the learning channel i think i remember at some point like uh seeing something that someone else is watching and seeing the logo is tlc but it wasn't at all a program appropriate for the learning channels. Like, is this learning channel? Oh no, it's just called TLC now. It's not. It's not the little do learning stuff anymore. No, no they don't. That's but there, there is a market for this garbage channel. TGC, the garbage channel. The gar <laughs> <laughs> There's a market for this, um, and thank God there are people uh, like yourself who are, who, are, who are doing the work to get the information to all of us who are inspired uh, by it because. Um, the lit literacy, uh, the literacy in basic science concepts, as much as we've made progress since the 1960s, when the United States radically um, tried to change the edu educational system to do more science stuff, and thank goodness, because we got so many uh, great things starting from the 80s, uh, when those next generations grew up to start creating for the benefit of all human society. But still, man, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can just throw my hands up in the air. I don't have a good. Yeah, answer. it's. I I feel your frustration definitely. We have a question. Um, what do you think are the main issues with Blue Origin, and what do they need to do to get up uh, to their goals with New Shepherd and New Glenn? You know, I I think the main problem with Blue Origin is their lack of effective leadership. Um, you know, I mean that now is that a slam on Jeff Bezos? Maybe if he's not involved enough, um, he needs to get more involved. And if he is heavily involved and he's the one directing things, then the dude's got some serious problems because, you know, it's Blue Origin has been a nonstop parade of disappointments. Um, it's, I mean, New Shepard, first of all, is nothing more than a suborbital bungee jump. It's, it's a carnival ride, a parlor trick, you know, I mean, it's, and you pay 10 or $20 million to ride on it. It's absurd. Yeah. Um, so I, I you don't You said you see wouldn't it. ride on it, I think. Not, but probably not. No. Even if it were free? Well, if it were offered to me, it would be so good for my channel for me to fly on it. Yeah, I'm sure I would. I'm That's sure right. I would, but, That's right. but you know, is would it, it, it would be my last choice on how to go right. to space. Yeah. Um, if you were just, if you weren't um, a, uh, a, a reporter on space, then, then I can imagine you, you passing it up, preferring uh, Virgin Galactic instead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. VG is better just because I, well, once again, it's kind of the same concept, but 
it's more like the alien drop ship, you know, that's more exciting. And we're on express elevator to hell, man, going <laughs> down. You know, I mean, that would just be a blast. But that I mean, aside, cool. aside from that, also VG is focusing a lot more on scientific uh, experiments going up on their ships. At Alan the Stern, I don't know if he actually went yet. I think he wanted to and had an experiment to go. Um, I haven't mm -hmm. uh, touched base with him to know if he actually got to do that. But that's right. They're doing real real science uh yeah. thank you andrew uh, kirkpatrick for the super chat go canada indeed our wonderful uh neighbors to the north actually i don't do you know any uh canadian uh involvement in the space program off the top of your head I... oh absolutely i mean the canadian canada is heavily involved in everything nasa does um they're always contributing something to the program of course the canada is you know the the biggest thing, but I would say the most ex exciting thing coming out of Canada, at least potentially, is um, their uh, space engine systems. Um, they're building a space plane also, mm. um, and they claim that they're going to be doing a suborbital test up there for a space plane next year. Canadian space um, plane? Another space plane next year? Yes. Yes. I got th is that three or four? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> That's great. Um, more space the Chinese planes. are building one, too. So More space planes. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's so, terrific. but yeah, that's their, their, their stuff looks uh, very interesting. Again, hybrid engine kind of concept starting off uh, with a ramjet kind of approach. Um, and then it transitions over to a rocket engine once they reach Mach 5 or something. But um, sounds like so the, uh, we'll the, the, the Top Gun Maverick Dark Star a bit. Yeah. <laughs> that's great, man. That's, uh, that's terrific news. Glad to hear it. Well, uh, Nectarios uh, Christofori asks what about health issues pre preventing humans from surviving in space uh such what what technology can't protect us or can it well what do you need to protect against cosmic rays and what do you need to protect against solar flares for example since those are different yeah, I did a, um, I actually did an, a, an episode on this very recently. Um, one of a, a friend of mine, who's also one of my supporters um, on Discord and such, uh, he, he works at the Sizewell Nuclear Reactor um, in Suffolk um, here in Britain. Um, I got to see the reactor and everything. It was amazing. Um, but he is a physicist who specializes in radiation shielding. Is this and the video the, at the top here? Um, no, it's the one, let's see, that was a live stream. There it is. Nuclear starship in the radioactive void. Excellent. That's the one. Very good. Go check that out. Everyone. Regrettably not a very popular video either. Cause it's got some great stuff on, um, hmm. on, on that. Probably the most detailed video I've done yet on, on solar radiation and cosmic rays. And, um, yeah, it's, it, th it is something that we need to learn a lot more about as to, you know, what's really going to happen in Fortunately, we have gained a lot of that knowledge on this particular mission with Orion. Orion has been, of course, exposed to everything that the interstellar void can throw at it ever since it left our magnetic field. Um, and all of that has been very studied in great detail. On top of that, you can see just below it uh, my video with that uh, late young lady in a vest. That vest is a radiation vest that's designed to protect your internal organs from radiation. And currently they have um, one of those vests on something called a moonikin instead of mannequin on Orion, and then another moonikin that doesn't have a vest. And uh, that obviously the both of those have been subjected to uh, cosmic rays and solar radiation and and they have simulated human organs inside them and such to see how much damage they take and to see whether or not those vests will provide some degree of protection. But the short answer is water. Water will give us all the protection we need in interstellar space. Um, and we need to build that into all of our interplanetary designs is to have the water that is necessary for us to survive on an interplanetary mission anyway. We're going to need that water. All of that should be stored in tanks that are like an, a, a water armor or water Kevlar vest surrounding um, the astronauts in the spacecraft. That will stop the vast majority of, of cosmic rays and radiation dead. Does, um, G yeah, have, does the uh, Lunar Gateway have that in its design? No, it's, it, it no. isn't. It's I thought none there was of that something in Artemis that was going to happen. No, I, I must be mistaken. 
Yeah, um, I mean, we are really going to get a we're going to get a crash course in in uh, radiation once we do a lot of that, uh, with a lot of those experiments, and and you know, and but the the amount of of radiation that an astronaut gets subjected to, you know, in a month in space, for example, is not altogether dangerous. It's not great, but it's not anywhere near a full sievert worth of radiation. Um, mm -hmm. A full sievert is what NASA regards as being safe or acceptable anyway for an astronaut to take, um, you know, during the course of their career. So, you know, during the course of an entire Mars mission, we're talking, you know, six months there um, and another 18 months or so on the on Mars and then six months back, you're going to suck up between one and two sieverts um, with our with our current uh, design. So we've got to build something into our uh, into our spacecraft and into our surface habitats on Mars to bring that figure down to under the one sievert mark, and we can, we definitely can. Is the one um, to two sievert without the a, a water insulation? Without any significant protection, of course. Well, that is assuming that you don't get slammed by a major solar storm. If you do, that changes the equation big time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a solar storm without proper protection could potentially kill everyone on the spacecraft. I recall in the Mars Direct designed by Robert Zubrin that there's a pantry in the inside of, um, of the tuna can of the HAB that has food and everything as well as water uh, around it and that in about solar flares we know when they're going to when they're on their way towards say a spacecraft like like that that's going interplanetary so we'd um, be able to alert the crew they'd be able to go in there and wait for you know just, they have all the food in there they can they never survive uh, a couple hours if they had to um uh we have a question from uh craig of uh, what jobs of a non-technical uh, uh nature would be sought after when we do actually land on Mars and have people on Mars? Medical would be the first mm. big thing. Um, I would say that that being a doctor, I mean, we are definitely going to need doctors and more than just one too. You've got to at least have, you know, one doctor backing up the other um, with any uh, interplanetary mission. Um, I think it's very important that we have that in place. If you have one medical officer and something happens to them, then you're in deep trouble. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a big one. We're not going to have the same level of medical support going to Mars that we're, that we've had in the past. I mean, even online consultation is, you know, impractical because of the light travel time from earth to Mars. Um, so yeah, I would say medical is going to be one of the most important things, um, for, for any future interplanetary missions. I hope we get to see that million man city on, on Mars, man by man spacecraft. I mean, human, pardon my, my old fashioned sounding English. Yeah, me too. I'd make the same mistake. I, uh, it, uh one, one with mankind and so forth. I hope, uh, hope uh, people, uh, in general are, are generous enough to realize, uh, the, they're the, at least once upon a time, inclusive nature of such of such terms. Um, and uh, Nadia just brought up how gravity, um, the low gr uh, gravity, both on, on the moon, Mars, and of course the zero gravity conditions in interstellar space are a huge issue. In fact, that's something I wanted to ask you about because that's something that long frustrated me. Basically, I read my angry astronautism began by uh, uh, once I, I read um, uh, The Case for Mars back in, oh, Two, I think, is when I, I first read it, and how Zuber is just so frustrated. Why have we not tested doing, you know, gravity in space? Not a little thing, but getting a spent out booster on one end, and you have a capsule on the other. Um, I haven't looked to see if anybody's actually going to try anything anytime soon. But uh, what have you seen as far as there's, artificial there's gravity? one organization that wants to build an a uh, an artificial gravity space station. Um, oh, what do they call it again? Uh, yeah, I'm forgetting it. Venture, well. venture, venture, maybe no, no. Um, I, it, the 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 so, the, the station itself there. is called the Voyager, right? Um, and now I'm forgetting. They they want to do an interview with me at some point. Um, but yeah. I don't see that station being built anytime real soon. It's super um, complex looking. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it would take quite a lot of, of effort and a lot of rocket launches in order to get that functional. But yeah, I think that is important. Um, and, and, you know, it was Nadia, I think her name was, who, who asked mm -hmm. the question or, or made the statement. Um, yeah, it is very true. I mean, you know, now, once again, we don't have an understanding of what reduced gravity does to the human body. That's something we really don't know a damn thing about. We know what microgravity does. So we know what's going to happen if it's a six month journey journey there and a six month journey back. And by the way, that's a big argument for nuclear propulsion. Let's cut that journey down to 90 days instead of Nerva. Six months. Let's you go know, Nerva. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and NASA intends, by the way, to have nuclear propulsion in operation before they actually attempt to fly to Mars. Um, but so, no spacecraft for that. A pardon? Yeah. They, they don't have it on any spacecraft. I've, I've seen, I think no. you even talked about the potential of putting it on um, the, uh, the SpaceX starship uh which yeah would be great. The first the first actual planned experiment with the nuclear thermal engine built into it is on a vulcan centaur in 2026 um but yeah the uh that's that is a big issue we do but we know what a year in microgravity is going to do to the human body it's manageable um if, if if it's just a year but what we don't know is what another two years in one third gravity is going to do we really don't know that at all so that is that is a, a definitely a big unanswered question. Nuclear propulsion, the Ryan project in the 60s. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it ever could have happened because Project Orion, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the concept is to detonate small um, hydrogen bombs, uh, small thermonuclear weapons behind a, a spacecraft with a big blast plate behind it. And that absorbs, it's kind of like a shock absorber and that pushes, it's like a, you know, as, uh, as, and pushes you up to a substantial fraction of the speed of light. Project Orion, I believe could get you up to about 10 or 11 percent of the speed of light um unbelievably fast but, but of course goodness. that also requires that you're detonating lots of thermonuclear weapons in in earth orbit um which sounds really terrifying now, one launch, if, if i remember the original plan <laughs> yeah yeah now that is insane that is insane it's, yeah and they did art. experiment with some of that there's they, they actually have it on film of doing things like that um yeah. that is kind of crazy it, it, um, it, i think the channel is called Hayes Gray Art, who does computer uh, simulations that look almost real, almost photorealistic of spacecraft that actually have launched and also ones that never launched or may right. launch in the future. And because I knew about that, but to actually see it depicted like, you know, it, I think there's something like lifts, throws it up and then the first nuclear it, thermonuclear explosion goes off in the atmosphere and it pushes up and it gets out of space. And it's like, wow. I'm glad they canceled that. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it does seem very frightening. But, you know, the, the, the concept, the, the principle behind doing that, um, if you were to launch it, say, from lunar orbit or even uh, mid-Earth orbit MEO, um, if you were to do that, that would probably be relatively safe. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's the only way we know of right now, anyway, that we could reach, you know, relativistic speeds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, where I mean, we go? I mean, it, it um, twenty you know, t twenty years to get to Alpha Centauri, uh, or Proxima Centauri. I mean, is yeah, that's worthwhile. But uh, forty years, yeah, it's a little, a little bit, a little bit long. But not not so great. Um, I mean, you could send a probe there, I suppose. Um, in in a few decades, that might be an interesting thing. But also, I mean, if you have that kind of capability, depending on how finely, how refined it is, I mean, you could get to Pluto, you know, in a you know in a day or a couple of days. Well, you know, it would make wild. travel throughout the solar system a lot easier, um, a lot more practical um, and efficient. So, mm. yeah, I mean, yeah, there are certainly applications for it, but just a lot of complexity with shooting off that many nuclear weapons in earth orbit kind of frightening a little bit i yeah maybe something like that plus nerva some kind of nuclear um uh based um a propulsion system that would be be terrific uh, because it could cut the, like you were saying the, the time to get to uh mars into three months Although I think it's worth, at least with chemical propulsion, it's worthwhile to consider that the free return trajectory is, uh, which is six months, is is good, at least for initial missions, because if you miss Mars, you can come back to Earth and meet. Yes. 
a good chance of survival. If you go three months with chemical or something, then you, you might miss. <laughs> you know, it yeah. becomes a lot the narrower. Um, the margins are a lot more uh, narrow. Well, that let let's go for at least for a moment onto something else. You're in the UK. And I uh, remember you talking in a variety of, of videos about your affection for, for England and for the United Kingdom in general and uh, uh, being uh, someone who often lives, lives abroad. Uh, I really, really resonate with that. So what, what about England and the UK has enchanted you and, uh, and brought you to want to live there? I love the country. I mean, it's it's a, it's a remarkable place on so many levels, from the history to the people to the culture. I mean, it's just amazing. But aside from that, um, there's so much happening space flight wise here that was not happening 12 years ago. Um, yeah. The UK Space Agency, did, did, in 2009, the UK Space Agency didn't even exist. Huh. And now it is, you know, a well-funded government program that has some very ambitious projects that it's working on, including things like uh, uh, space debris cleanup. Um, they they have uh, they are investing 100 million pounds in that over the course of the next three years. Um, also, orbiting solar power plants, which, in my opinion, is the ultimate in green energy. Um, yeah. That's cool stuff. I mean, so many cutting edge uh, things that they are working on. Also, they have a philosophy of sustainability um, with their space exploration program and, and, and privatized space and all that sort of thing. Sustainability is a big thing with them, which is a really good idea. I think it's important. I think it's responsible. Um, so yeah, there are many things happening in this country that are inc just incredibly exciting. Um, I've I remember first, uh, I mean, it was long ago when the idea was proposed to put solar panels um, connected to a, a microwave uh, emitter and then have microwave receivers on the Earth to col to collect solar power. I don't know if it's a geostationary orbit necessarily, but but is it geostationary? In the yeah, it's geostationary. It um, be, Project I mean. Cassiopeia has been designed at this point. Um, now they that's, just need to, to now they just need to send up a proof of concept and all that. What's the timeline um, yeah. on that? super exciting hard to say um they didn't give me a timeline on that one i think it's mm. largely dependent on funding but nevertheless i got to talk to the i got to it's it's on my channel actually it's yeah called project cassiopeia um but i got to interview the uh the engineer who's in charge of that program and uh it is very very exciting stuff uh that's going on at, at the moment with that and it's it's just a great great plan i mean we're these things these are massive massive um solar power stations in orbit that generate a gigawatt worth of power each one of them um they're you know just uh yeah cassiopeia orbital solar yeah that's amazing mm. stuff that they're working on right now one of the best interviews that i've ever had as you can see once again not very popular um, it, compared to some of my other videos, but uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, there there are people who like it. So I keep doing 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 it for them, creating those videos for them. And uh, yeah, just an amazingly exciting stuff that's going on with uh, with orbital solar um, that, you know, for the long run is, I think, the solution for greenhouse gases and, and sustaining our technology and sustaining our civilization. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, that's world changing. Creative. Yeah, that's completely world changing that to be able to have uh, relatively low cost and highly abundant solar power. I mean, if anybody needs an excuse to know why we should have a space program, let's at least <laughs> everybody out there remember this wonderful, wonderful thing, um, because uh, it, it, it really could uh, could make things better. And by the way, everyone out there, the Angry Astronaut channel is almost at 100,000 subscribers. So I hope you'll be uh, willing out there today to go ahead uh, and uh, and help increase that number most deservedly because uh, the while there are there are many great uh, channels out there that cover space, but no one does it like the Angry Astronaut. And uh, again, why do I have that opinion? Because um, uh, what he brings uh, uh, is this uh, amazing kind of honesty now everybody out there is definitely trying to give you the facts but the fact but because it's combined with the this this deeply felt uh opinion 
we get to feel exactly where you're coming from. And so I think that helps us to uh, relate. And also the prolificness. How many videos do you put out? At least one a week, right? No, no, I actually you know? put them out one every day or two days. I actually. know. It's incredible. And it's yeah. these are important things that we all uh, ought to be aware of. So I, you're having a tremendously uh, positive impact. And everybody out there, please go subscribe to help uh, – uh, rightly. Oh yeah. What are you going to do when you get to a hundred thousand? You got something. Um, right. I, I'm going to launch new Schleppard. Um, the, uh, that's it. That they, they make a little toy of their little capsule. So I'm going to, uh, I've got some, some partners in the fireworks business and, and we're going to see what, how far that thing can, can fly. Um, and, and see how good its abort system is. <laughs> In other words, it's not going to survive the experience, but uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to have the most entertaining uh, new shepherd launch of all time. <laughs> uh, I, I can't wait. Oh, hopefully it's uh, sooner than later. And thanks to everyone out there for uh, helping the ang angry astronaut to, to reach uh, that goal because uh, what he's providing uh, for all of us, it's something of great value. For years, I since you had 5,000 subscribers, I've been uh, following you. And because uh, it's interesting because one might think, oh, is he just going to be... Uh, YouTube was thankfully recommending your videos to uh, to me. And I, I took a look. Oh, okay, is he just going to be uh, complaining uh, or something or being negative? And no, it's not it at all. It's not... I wouldn't even call it negativity in any way. It's uh, anything. It's It's positivity through the the wet blanket of reality yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean. that's that's actually a good way to summarize what i do yeah <laughs> it's so important to hear um uh more uh we we always we all as a as a human race need to hear more about space and science facts the important details of uh economics that go behind here which you often cover uh your money things going over budget and things like uh of that nature as well so thank you so much for, for being with us uh, today. And I, I hope we can, if we don't do this again, maybe some other collaboration, if we're able to, to make it work, it would be, um, would be enormous, uh, enormously enjoyable for me. Uh, sir, could you love give us uh, one more send off? Stay angry about space. <laughs>